In this Doubler One Game Creator video tutorial series, we will be going over the basics of using the engine, from detailing what each of the main editors do, to learning how to create your very first game with NPCs and quests. In this fourth part, we'll be looking at scripting, timers, and zones, understanding the scripting language used in Doubler One Game Creator, the different ways it can be used, including how timers and zones work, and putting together scripts of your very own to add interactivity to your games. The scripting language Double One Game Creator uses is unique compared to most other game engines. Instead of typing lines of code, scripts are represented visually as a flowchart, with each event leading into another until no events remain. This makes it much easier to read the logic of your script, especially when it's been a while since you last touched it. For those that prefer manually typing lines of code, there is an option inside the mode menu to convert your scripts from graphical mode to textual mode. However, it's worth noting that textual scripting provides no advantage over graphical scripting. For this video tutorial, we will not be entering textual mode, so everything will be explained using the graphical scripter instead. To open the script editor and start compiling a script, we first need to decide which trigger will activate it. A trigger is a condition which, when met, will run whatever code is inside. There are numerous triggers in Double One Game Creator, ranging from colliding with an actor to pressing an assigned control. For now though, we'll use the player enters trigger inside the map properties window, so we can take a look at the script editor itself. When opening the script editor, you'll see a start event in the middle of the window. This is the very beginning of your script, from which other events are connected to via the branch at the bottom. Typically, events have branches on the top and bottom, but since this is the start event, it only has a bottom branch. Some events can have multiple branches. These are different paths your script may take, depending on the event chosen. For example, a message box event can have different choices, and depending on which is chosen, one of multiple paths is taken. You can move your mouse cursor over a branch to see the condition for that path to be chosen. To the right of the script editor is the quick access event list, which displays a list of commonly used events. You can customize this list from within the tools options window. To move around the script editor, simply press and hold the middle mouse button while moving the cursor. You can also zoom in and out by scrolling the mouse wheel. To move an event, simply click and drag it. To move multiple events, first click and drag within the script editor to highlight them, and then press and hold one of the events to move them all at once. Lastly, you can import and export script files from the script menu at the top. While working on your game, you'll undoubtedly spend a lot of time playing it to ensure everything is running as intended. You can use the play map and test map features located on the map editor toolbar to play a specific map, but in order to experience your game the same way your players will, you'll want to select test game from the main toolbar instead. Currently, however, when we click the test game icon, we're prompted by an error message telling us that we need to set up a starting map and starting location first. This is because we deleted the original maps provided by this template, and we haven't yet told 001 about our new starting map, so let's fix that. Click the game settings icon on the main toolbar to open the game settings window. In the top left corner, select your starting map from the drop-down menu. Then click on the starting location button underneath and choose an appropriate location for the player character to start from. You can press and hold the middle mouse button to pan around the map and use the scroll wheel to zoom in and out. Now when we click test game and click OK on the testing options window, the player character will start on the map and location we specified. However, most games don't typically start like this. Usually there's a main menu where players can start a new game or load an existing save file. Interfaces are perfect for this, but we'll be taking a proper look at them in a future video tutorial, so for now, we'll create something a little more rudimentary as a way to familiarize ourselves with the on scripting environment. To start, we need to modify the introduction system trigger by clicking on the system triggers icon on the main toolbar and double clicking introduction from the top. This is the trigger that runs as soon as the game launches. With the script editor open, we'll now put together a small script that asks the player if they want to start a new game or load an existing save. Currently, when you launch your game, the player will be automatically placed on the starting map, so we'll need to accommodate for this. First, click on the expand events button at the bottom of the script editor. This will show all of the events that you can use to script your games. In the top left is the complexity filter, each event has a different complexity assigned to it, and by clicking these four icons, you can filter the event list. You can also filter the list by clicking on one of the event categories down the left-hand side, or by using the search text box in the bottom left 
to find a specific event. The first event we need is the Pause Resume Game event, which can be found under the Game category. Double click this event to open its Event Properties window. Every event will have a comment text box at the top, which can be used to write notes about the event. This is particularly useful in larger projects, where you may forget what a particular event was intended for and need a reminder. Commenting is also useful in collaborative projects as a way to communicate with other developers. Something else each event has is a break into the script debugger when event is reached checkbox. When this option is ticked, a script debugger will open at runtime once this event is triggered, allowing you to step through your script one event at a time during gameplay. This is useful for tracking down bugs. It's worth noting that the script debugger will only show up while testing your game in the editor. It will not show up when playing a built game. The remaining options inside the event properties window are specific to that event. In the case of the pause resume game event, there's only a single toggle option to pause or resume gameplay. The small box to the right of each property is called the use value button, which we'll cover in a future video tutorial. For now, since we want to pause the game, select the pause state and click OK to add the event to our script. The next event we need for our script is the fade out event. This one should be located in your quick access event list to the right, under camera. Double click the event to bring up its properties window. We only need to change the time property. This is how long it takes for the game to fade out. Since we want the game to start faded out, set the time to 0 seconds and click OK. Next, we'll want to hide the HUD, or heads up display, which shows information like the player's health. To hide the HUD, click on the expand events button and double click the show hide HUD event under the camera category. Then select the invisible option and click OK. Now we need a message box event, which should be located in the quick access event list. Set the message to whatever you want, and then type new game for choice 1 and load game for choice 2. After creating the event, you'll notice it now has two branches. By default, the next event you add will be attached to the left branch. Therefore, we'll add the events needed for the new game choice first, beginning with a fade in event, which is located in the quick access event list. This time, we only need to tick the delay checkbox and click OK, as the default fade in time of 1 second is sufficient. The delay property will force the script to wait until the specified time has passed before continuing with the rest of the script. This way, the game will not resume until the screen has finished fading in. Anytime there is an event with a time property, you can tick the delay checkbox to force the script to wait for that amount of time. Now we need to resume the game. Since we already have a pause resume game event in our script, we can copy and paste the event. Right click it and select copy or highlight it and press Ctrl plus C on your keyboard. Then right click an empty area of the script editor and select paste or Ctrl plus V on your keyboard. You can then click and drag the event to move it where you want. To attach it to the fade in event, left click and hold the branch coming out of the fade in event. Move your mouse cursor over your new pause resume game event and release the mouse cursor to connect the events together. Now we need to change the event property from pause to resume. To do this, double click the new pause resume game event or right click the event and select edit to bring up its event properties window. Then select resume and click OK. Repeat these steps of the show hide HUD event, changing its property from invisible to visible. Now that the new game section of our script is finished, let's move on to the load game section. Select the message box event and then click on the expand events button and double click on the show load game event under the game category to add it to your script. Since this event doesn't have any specific properties, it will just be added to our script without a window popping up. However, you can still write a comment and place a breakpoint on the event by double clicking it or right clicking it and selecting edit from the context menu. The last and final step is to loop the show load game event back to the message box event so that if the player cancels the load game operation, it will bring them back to the message box event. To do this, left click and hold the bottom branch of the show load game event and move your mouse cursor over the message box event. Release the mouse cursor to connect them. If you ever need to remove a connection between two events, simply right click the connecting line to break it. You can also remove events by selecting them and pressing the delete key on your keyboard. To save your script, click the OK button in the bottom right of the script editor and then click OK on the system triggers window. Congratulations! You've just written your first script using the Graphical Scripter. To test your script, 
you can run your game using the test game button on the main toolbar and clicking OK on the testing options window. Now that we've learned a bit about the script editor, let's turn our attention towards timers and zones. These versatile objects are the next step in scripting your maps. Timers can be used to run scripts at regular intervals and also respawn enemies, whereas zones can be used to create interactable areas anywhere on your map, prevent actors from passing through them, or transport the player to a new location. The possibilities are truly endless once you've added these to your arsenal. Let's start by taking a look at timers. To place a timer on your map, select the Timer Spawn tool from the Map Editor toolbar and left click on an area on your map to place it. If you want to use it to respawn an actor, then you need to ensure that the timer is placed at the same position as the actor you wish to respawn. Once you've placed a timer, it will bring up the Timer Spawn Editor. To the left of the window, you can change the timer's name and position. The Timer section is where you can set an initial delay before the timer starts, as well as its interval, which is how frequently the timer will run. You can also specify a maximum number of times the timer will run for. Setting this value to zero means the timer will run continuously unless scripted to stop. The Wait Until section allows you to specify how close the player needs to be before the timer starts, and whether the timer must be turned on via the Start Stop Timer Spawn event. To the right of the window is the Triggers section, which lists all of the available scripting triggers for the timer. Lastly, the Spawn Actor section contains options relating to actor spawning, including how many actors can be spawned at any given time, and whether each new actor spawned should be given a unique name by adding a numerical value to the end of it. To try it out, let's create a spawn timer that respawns a goblin enemy after 30 seconds. To do this, first place a goblin actor located in the Goblin Pick Actor Template folder, then place a timer directly on top of it. When the timer spawn window opens, you should see the name of the goblin under the Spawn Actor section. If the name of the actor isn't shown here, then make sure you've placed the timer directly on top of the actor's icon. Set the initial delay value to zero so that the timer starts immediately, and then set the every interval value to 30 seconds. It's worth noting that because we're leaving the maximum simultaneous spawned actor's value as one, a new goblin won't spawn until this one has been defeated. So after 30 seconds, if the goblin is still alive, the timer will simply count another 30 seconds before attempting to spawn a new goblin. Now that we understand how timers work, the last thing we're going to look at are zones. To place a zone on your map, select the zone tool from the map toolbar and then select either the rectangle or polygon shapes from the panel to the left of the main window. With the rectangle shape selected, click and drag on your map to draw an area you'd like to cover. Then release the mouse cursor to create the zone. With the polygon shape selected, left click on the map to create corner points and then double click to finalize the zone. You can then use the pointer tool to adjust each node more precisely. Once you've created the zone's trigger area, it will bring up the zone editor. To the left of the window, you can change the zone's name, position, and its X, Y, and Z size, as well as whether or not it should start initially disabled, which means the zone won't have any effect on the map until the Enable Disable Zone event is called to enable it. The Destination on Touch section allows you to position the player on a new map or location when the player enters the zone. The blocking section allows you to deny entry of specific actor templates. This is extremely useful for creating areas that enemies can walk through that the player cannot. Lastly, to the right of the window is the triggers section, which lists all of the available triggers for the zone. By clicking the add button, you can see a full list of zone triggers, including mouse and touch triggers, which activate when the mouse cursor or touch inputs on a mobile device come into contact with the zone. To try it out, let's create a sign that when interacted with, displays a message to the player. To do this, first place a sign lower object tile located in the outside decoration tile set somewhere on your map. Then create a rectangle zone over the sign and double click the action key pressed beside zone trigger to open the script editor. Then simply add a message box event from the quick access event list to the right and type an appropriate message you want the player to see. Once finished, press the OK button to save the script and OK again to close the zone editor. Now click the play map icon on the map editor toolbar and click on an area near your sign. Click OK on the testing options window that pops up to start your game. Move towards the sign using the WASD or arrow keys and then press the action key, the enter key by default, to activate the zone and display your message. This concludes the fourth part of our video tutorial series 
detailing the basics of the Blue One Game Creator. In the next part, we'll be looking at creating interactable NPCs. Specifically, we'll be taking a look at one of the built-in quest-giving NPCs and learning how a collection quest works.